Hello and welcome to On the Ledger. We're starting 2023 off strong. We got a big uh, a big interview lineup coming for you this year. Um, I think this year, you know, I've, I've decided, especially after doing some reading, including the latest magazine um, from Meta Label over the break, that I, I really there's a whole bunch of like topics that I want to dive into more deeply personally. Um, you know, th- like threads that I want to follow. And, you know, I, I hope I get the opportunity to use on the ledger this year, um, you know, to, to follow some of those threads and to share my journey with, uh, with, with you all out there. So, so thanks for being with us. And very specifically today, thanks to my friend Yancy Strickler for joining us and talking about what you're doing with MetaLabel. Welcome, Yancy. Yeah. Fan of you, fan of the pod, fan of Ledger. <laughs> very happy to be here. And, and so, I mean, Yancey and I go back a long time into the, into the music business. Um, uh, Yancey's one of the co-founders of and formerly the CEO of Kickstarter. Um, Yancey and I spent some time together after his, his time at, at Kickstarter. And I don't think either of us you know, knew that we would, we would end up in the, in the Web3 space. I think maybe we were trying to start a religion, but that didn't go so well. Um, and, you know, but here, here we are. Maybe we found religion. Um, <laughs> just in two seconds or, you know, briefly, can you, can you give our listeners a, a sense of your journey? I mean, wh- where did you start? How did you end up CEO of Kickstarter? Um, and, and, and how, and I guess maybe that's the longer part, like how and why Meta Label? Yes. Yeah, so I, I grew up on a farm in Southwest Virginia, like a, a country boy who didn't belong. I just read books and loved music and especially loved indie rock and dreamed of the wider world. And uh, in college, got hired to be one of the first writers for Pitchfork. And from there, started reviewing records for The Village Voice and Spin Magazine. And was just sort of on the edges of the music world, writing about the weird things that I enjoyed. Uh, Started a tiny label, putting out uh, first records by baby bands. And it was during that time that uh, I made a new friend, Perry Chen, who had had this idea for what we now call crowdfunding. And that was the start of Kickstarter in 2005. And, you know, where, where I really connected with the vision of that was just seeing that for the sorts of art and music that I liked, whether it's indie film or indie record or underground hip hop or indie rock or underground hip hop, like it's really hard to finance. It's really hard to get made because no one is making that much money off it in the end. Uh, So like investors are not inclined to put a lot of money into it. And those projects are just like begged, borrowing, and stealing just to exist. And Kickstarter was this way that fans could have a say, that I could directly support the people I cared about. And it just felt like the most obvious thing in the world that that needed to happen. So I I really came to feel like Kickstarter was like we we built a door in a wall where everybody knew there needed to be a door. Like no one could quite picture it. But like as soon as it was there, it was like, oh, yeah, sure. This has always been here. And it it instantly felt uh, obvious and natural. And uh, and so Kickstarter continues to go strong, six billion dollars to creators to date through that. Um, but then the last sort of three years got pulled into uh, you know what I think of now as like the on-chain era, and really feeling compelled by the technical potential of blockchain-based world, and feeling like. Uh, almost like the, a blockchain functions the way a kid thinks the internet functions of like, there's this centralized repository of information and truth that you can go check things against. And it's like, it's organized and, you know, and it's self self-sustaining somehow self-sufficient. I feel like that, that is what uh, the chain represents. And really through your, a lot of it through your tutelage and uh, mentorship have become a proper degen. Uh, in the past year, I just I'm sorry, really man. enjoy. Yeah, I know. I know. It's like a low light, uh, but one I uh, is part of me now. But I really do enjoy uh, and find the culture of on-chain art uh, of NFTs to be fascinating, to be cool. Uh, in my mind, to be even more exciting the past three months, I think, than ever. And um, and yeah, and so so I'm now in this universe, but but in it with a. Uh, a very specific kind of project in, in Meta Label, which we can talk about. But and, yeah. and before we yeah before we get to that, there's something um, that I think is a I see as a bridge between Kickstarter and, and Meta Label that I'd I'd love to hear more from you on because 
you know, you, the way that you just described Kickstarter is, is as if it were this sort of obvious thing that, you know, that wasn't there. And then once it was there, it felt like it always was. And I think that's true. And, and people know what crowdfunding is. But actually, I think what's interesting is that Kickstarter exists really on it, it, it's a it's something of itself. If I tell somebody it's a Kickstarter, there's a bunch of things that people know about it before I've told them anything else, um, right? Because you guys really made Kickstarter a format. Um, a Kickstarter, you know, if I say it's a Kickstarter, then whomever I'm talking to immediately knows, yes, it's crowdfunding, but there's a video, there are pledges. If the money isn't all raised, then the money goes back. Like that's very specific and not all crowdfunding platforms have those same characteristics. I like to think of it as, it's like, it's like um, uh, Cherish the Day by Sade. It's actually more interesting what's not in that song than what is in a way. Like the, the choices of what they left out are so incredible um, and kind of, you know, mind blowing. I'm really like personally curious, like how did you guys have the restraint to not kind of put everything into Kickstarter and to really say, no, Kickstarter, there is going to be a gate. Not everyone can join. No, we are not going to add that feature. In fact, <laughs> we're, we're only, we yeah. only have these features. How did you have that restraint? And like, what was the, what was the, the, the idealism that, that, that led to that? I mean, it's a, it's a constant battle that I think rem remains one in the company of, <sighs> I think any creative project, you're con there's like a constant default towards mediocrity towards being like everything else and to resist that is like the hardest thing to do because it's always quite sensible to do the thing that people want and uh it takes courage i feel like to not do that for us i, f I feel like we we the crowdfunding term didn't exist when we were first starting but we saw this utility of like conditional funding we saw how it could apply to anything but we also felt like what we actually care about is art and creative projects and so kind of we that's the only space we have the right to like work for that we really deeply care about. And if we're trying to be Walmart and like capture everything that uses this mechanism, of course we're going to fail. But if we can be specific about our intentions um, and like serve a, a specific use case that we believe in, then like we, we got a shot and we're probably going to care about that more than anybody. And, and maybe that lets us, you know, uh, earn trust and build a great business and a great reputation. And so I think it's like, there has to be a little bit of humility to say like, we're not, you can't have everything there. There is winner take all really doesn't work in, I know it's supposed to work in the web, but there's so many markets and niches and things get verticalized and, you know, horizontal platforms become verticalized. There's all these ways that, that things evolve over time. And so I think knowing what ground you're trying to protect, what it is that you stand for, what it is you don't care about, uh, what features are core to defining the essence of your of being in your space versus someone else's space? It, it's often that these are it's like the counterintuitive decision to not do something that I think ends up holding out better long long term. But like it's a daily fight to not become mediocre. It's so easy. It's like way easier to become mediocre than it is to be exceptional. And I feel like there's a a diligence and a fight that you just have to kind of have in your spirit. Um, but yeah, it's. I commend projects or people that have that, that have that spirit. It's hard. It's, it's not easy. And there was, there were other parts of Kickstarter as a business that were innovative um, beyond what we just described. You know, for example, you guys were, what do you call it? Is it a, a corporation for public good? Is it the right word? Public, public benefit corporation, PPC. Public benefit corporation. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me just quickly, because I think, you know, a, a, I think it's part of the interesting part of the, you know, as you said, the exceptional leadership of, of Kickstarter between you and you and Perry and your board as well, that you decided um, to really convert the company to that much harder to do while the plane is flying, I'm sure than it, than, than doing it from the outset. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what you would tell the audience about that in, in, in terms of, you know, was that, um, was it something you would do again? Was it something you wouldn't do again? Like how, how do you, yeah. It's, it's a, certainly an amazing idea um, to have a corporation uh, try to have public benefit and not only uh, drive shareholder value. Um, but what's the reality of that? Yeah, we started off as like a traditional C Corp in our structure, but like operationally, we were closer to a indie label, you know, where we just, we weren't, we weren't optimizing for the bottom line. We were optimizing for impact and just doing what felt right. But we, um, Kickstarter has been a profitable company since its 14th month in business. So that gave us a lot of latitude to where we, we really could make decisions according to what felt right to us. And five years in at the height of our powers and the height of our like brand power, 
um, we made this choice to reincorporate the company. And the, this new legal structure called a PPC had been around for about a year or two at that point. And basically, it's a it's a formal corporate structure where whereby you declare in a charter what your legally responsible goals are as a company. And basically, it's so that you can balance shareholder maximization with other uh, other provisions, other things. So you're saying we are putting legally on the record that we are not just going to maximize shareholder value. These are this is like what's front and center for us. And we made a charter of like 13 things that were central that you know included like very mission oriented things and uh, giving money five percent of profits away to charity every year, but also things like prohibiting tax avoidance strategies by the company. Um, and you know we put out. Put that out to as a to a vote to all of our shareholders. No one disagreed because this is kind of always who we'd been. And for us, it brought uh, I'd say two things. One, a sense of relief that like our legal documentation fits how we are operating the company. There's not this mismatch that we always kind of felt. And then I was CEO when we did this, and I could feel that whereas in the past maybe you would debate like should we do this social good thing? Should we should we like be the nice guys? Uh, and it was always like, I don't know, there's other priorities. But once it was in our charter that like we were about standing up for the rights of artists, suddenly things, there are a lot of things that we felt mandated to do. And it was like, we have to do this. Like we are not being who we say we are if we don't do this. So it, it made those things more real. Um, I continue to think it's a, it's a strong form. It's a strong structure, um, especially as companies get bigger. Uh, I, I have come around more to just like believing strongly in small teams and small projects and their ability to have a big impact and, um, you know, smaller teams can operate on, can have these sorts of structures like a PPC, but it can be less formal, uh, until you to scale bigger. But yeah, I think there's now something like between five and 10,000 public benefit corporations in the U S and, uh, you know, really applaud all the, all the groups that have taking that extra step to say it's not just about making money for our shareholders, but there's a bigger picture here. Thank you. That's super interesting. I think people will find that interesting. Um, moving to, to MetaLabel, um, MetaLabel in a way, to me, the, and, and the reason I mentioned the, the kind of Kickstarter as a format is because I really see how your brain works a bit and that that's at play here, right? MetaLabel, a MetaLabel, first of all, um, you're overloading the already overloaded word label, and then you're overloading the already overloaded word record um, and you're creating formats. So tell people what the hell meta label is. How did it start? Who did you start it with? What's your mission at meta label and you know, where are you now? So a, a meta label is a release club where a group of people, a group of creators who share the same taste or vision or goals uh, release work together. So you can imagine that, um, well, we could take an example from your past. We could think of grand Royal, Records uh, and Grand Royal Magazine, which is a project started by the Beastie Boys. And Grand Royal existed to put out music and celebrate sort of street culture and things that the Beastie Boys and, you know, your, your larger network really cared about. So you made a magazine, you put out records by others. Um, and that this structure of like the Beastie Boys using their cultural power to lift up other people that shared their same worldview, that shared their same taste just sort of like flying a flag for, um, you know, the kind of culture that they loved and cared about is a, is a really powerful form that has really shaped the modern world. I would say, um, the, what I see is the very first example of a meta label of this kind of release club of a group of people putting out work that shares the same worldview is the Royal society who first created the idea of science and created the enlightenment. And they published the, first writings by Sir Isaac Newton and they published Benjamin Franklin and they made the first scientific journals and they invented peer review. And they were a group of 15 people who believed in a more evidence-based way of looking at the world. And so they started putting out a monthly zine, basically saying, here's how we see things. And gradually more people came to see the world that way. They put out books that generated an even bigger impact. But there was always this shared umbrella organization had different authors, different people participated at different moments. There was like a shared resource pool they used to accomplish their larger mission. And that organization is still going, you know, 500 years later. Um, record labels, record labels, book publishers, mischief, friends with benefits, uh, nouns, 
All of these to me are examples of the same thing. Groups of people who form a, a shared organization that represents some cultural goal. And then they're just putting out drops. They're putting out work that reflects their point of view. If you think of like a punk label, you know, every record a punk label puts out, it's like manifesting more punkness in the world. And so the last 10 years, the creator economy, uh, like and the, the web at large has been very individualistically driven where we're all meant to be the stars of our channel. We're competing against each other for likes and eyeballs. And like, we can all feel the burnout that comes from that. And it's like, not very fun and you know anxiety and competitiveness suck uh when it comes to creative expression um and so you know what what we're trying to make happen is we're showing people and we're and we're trying to reintroduce a structure where creative people can cooperate and can collaborate to where you and i who make similar kinds of work rather than being frenemies like competing for the same social status instead we can band together and say you know what we love generative art. We're, we put out generative art projects by us and by others. We have an economic arrangement where we split some money together. And so there's a whole infrastructure for how to operate that way. And so we're making that infrastructure. The past year, we kind of memed it into existence. We've created a psychic infrastructure of like, there's a concept called a meta label and it's how groups of creators work together. And uh, we've already seen, you know, a dozen groups self-proclaim uh, self -proclaim themselves as meta labels and using the form. This year, we're dropping uh, a marketplace and an architecture where groups can establish themselves and where they can exist uh, on chain or off and or off chain. Um, and through our site, they will be able to publish works by multiple authors, uh, all attributed to the same label. Like we dropped a work by Ian, we dropped a work by Yancey. And in each of those works, there's a great economic split where our default is that 70% of the proceeds of a drop go to the creator who made it and 30% go back to the meta labels treasury, which becomes capital that you can use to fund a next drop. And so that as you go, you're promoting your cultural view, whatever it is you care about, you're growing your own treasury, enabling you to empower more people to do this as well. And more and more people are coming to see the world the way that you see it. And so you could there's have, you this, could have multiple there's, you could have multiple models there though. You could have like the meta label version, which is seventy percent to the creator. You could have the the Barry Gordy slash Motown world where it's one percent to the creator and ninety nine yes. percent to Barry. Sorry, Barry, I love yes. you. Man. Um, <laughs> yes, you could have the um, the fifty you know, the fifty fifty touch and go model. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there exactly, literally there is going go. to be like, what is your business model? There will be that option, and one will be like major label, <laughs> and it's just exactly. like Ma major no label nineteen fifties, major label. Yeah. 2006, you know, um, that would yeah. be amazing. Oh, sorry. So there's like a, there's like a cultural and an economic engine here that works of you, you make a drop, funds get split, you make another drop, funds get split. And by joining together as a meta label, really people are agreeing, like, we're all going to hype each other. If one of us dropped something, we all dropped it. And, and, and you create that sort of bond. And I could tell you from experience, like, as a creative person, you feel way less alone where you're like, at least five people are going to like this because they've already been helping me. Like I'm not within meta label. We talk about holding hands before a drop. Like let's all hold hands because it's pretty terrifying before you put a work out there. But it weirdly, even in a discord, italics holding hands, like <laughs> creates some emotional, <laughs> some emotional feeling. Um, and so then the other layer, the other, you made reference to this, but like within our universe, we, we've created a format to drop through. And that format is a record. And a record, you may think of as like an album, like vinyl. And here we're using record as a record of creation. And so we've made a, a, a digital object that looks like a, you know, it, 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 I don't know how to describe how it looks. It looks like if a record and an iPad like had a baby or something. And uh, this beautiful object that opens. But it's a, it's a container. This record is a container, an on-chain container inside of which a, a meta label a creator can add any sort of media. You can add, a, uh, you could have an NFT, you can have a, a voucher to get a physical item, you could have a download of something, you could have a special access key or a ticket. Um, but our feeling is that uh, putting creative work on chain is, uh, has all kinds of wonderful benefits, but what's needed are, are containers and formats where it's not just this flat two dimension of like, it's just an image or it's just a song, uh, which I think just fits a limited number of use cases, but instead it's, it's an actual container through which people can create a world and people can buy that world. They can open it, they can collect it, they can trade it. 
And, and this we think is how we can get more and more creative people to like, to want to have their work on chain, you know, to want to have their work in a record, to want to have their work turned into an artifact with its context and provenance preserved forever. Uh, and I, and I think that that's something that creative people are very open to. Um, and even ones that are not open to crypto, which I see as a totally separate world as on chain. I, I see crypto and on chain as separate worlds, but yeah, we believe in the power of a format, you know, of, of defining a, uh, an interaction. There's a container inside. There are different kinds of goods. You can open it. Uh, you can choose to leave it sealed and resell it somewhere else. Uh, and so we dropped our very first record in December, which is for a zine, a physical and digital zine. For 70 bucks, you got, uh, you got the record inside. There's a voucher where you can get sent a physical zine if you wish. You also get a digital one. And those went great. Those sold out in just a couple hours. Uh, and that was our first attempt at just putting this form into the world. And uh, we got a great response. And you'll see the first records dropping from other groups, not us, in the first quarter of this year. Yeah, and people can still buy the physical zine, I believe, right? It's still for sale. Well, it, it also so, it sold the physical zine sold out, but it's going to be in some physical bookstores soon. Knock on wood. Oh, cool. It's really good. I highly recommend people read it. I actually just, just read it over the holiday break. So I, and I want to touch on a little bit of what's in that book, but I, I want to um, just like double click on a couple things you said, because what it, what occurs to me that's, that's incredibly interesting and it's, I find it like really encouraging because, you know, I was, when I came into the web, I was um, uh, juxtaposing the web against the pre-web world. Right. And I was thinking about, you know, what a record label in, in the world of kind of unlimited distribution might look like. And that is what we did with Grand Royal. And, and ultimately we, we went bankrupt in, in late 99 or early, early 2000, actually. Um, and the, and, and, and there are definitely, you know, interesting parts of that. And as soon as you showed me what you were doing with the record format, I texted Mike D and I said, man, if I was 22 and you were 29, <laughs> again, we would be, we'd be, we'd be on this, we'd be on this right away. Um, now we might be too old and too busy with other things, but man, I can absolutely imagine, you know, Grand Royal running on this, but also I think Motown is a great example. You know, I've thought many times about how, you know, what, what Motown did by having everything in house is very doable today. Um, you know, you've got uh, songwriters, a band, the ability to produce and, and, you know, run the record over the radio station. That's what Motown was doing. And that looks a lot like the world where, you know, somebody records an album at, at home and then they put it into their bedroom, but you, you made a, a super important point um, which is that you, you, it's better with collaborators. Like Barry Gordy was not alone famously, right? You know, he had songwriters, he had an incredible band. He had people like, you know, little Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye walking through the door, um, you know, every day. So he was not alone. And, and actually part of the problem with that Motown model was that the guy with the, with the studio and the songwriters and the band had an inordinate amount of leverage. And there wasn't a, a, a construct, you know, to distribute the money at the end of the day. You know, mm -hmm. one guy got it. And then if he felt like giving it to you, he gave it to you. Right. Um, and one thing I love that you told me about with the record format is that you have this this um, concept of recoupment. So you've got the treasury wallet, the individual's wallet, but also the let's make sure we, you know, get back the money that we put into this project wallet, um, which is which is which is amazing. Yeah, um, we, we 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 call it a cascade. We we worked the OX splits model, but we. When you drop a record, you first set what is the amount of money to be recouped. We set aside that money from the drop to one wallet. And then after the recoup is satisfied, then your splits follow after that. So for us, we first set aside three grand to pay for physically making things. And then the next 10 grand got split between you know, 20 people. Uh, but that is like just a programmatic thing there from the beginning. Um, that is just about making sure the metal label can keep operating, keep doing well, and, more drugs. This, this is where I, I find it incredibly exciting. And what I wanted to ask you to do is to juxtapose, um, you know, what you're creating and you're doing it a bit here. And it's why I find it so exciting against kind of the, 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 you know, the web two, um, you know, version of, of what we've all been living through, which, which you just did a moment ago. But I think what's so interesting to me is, again, you know, I remember, you know, 1994 and seeing the Internet Underground Music Archive um, for the first time and thinking like, this is it, man. It's, you know, the, the, it's going to this is going to level the playing field and major record labels are are going to have their day, you know, um, and look what we got in the end. Like I did digital music for 20 years and what we got was just a different shaped oligopoly. Right. Instead of five record labels, we have three. Um, instead of, um, you know, a bunch of record stores, we've got, you know, 
an oligopoly of, you know, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, and, and Apple. Um, and the artists still don't, the value, the value, well, and by the way, there was a bit of a, of a, of a, of a power shift to artists. Let's be honest, you know, record deals after 2006 do look different They're You know, they're an artist like Drake or, you know, Taylor Swift does have more power than an artist like them had 20 years previous. So let's, let's, you know, let's talk about progress where there, where there was, um, you know, but, you know, by and large, you know, to your point, you know, there's, there, there wasn't, um, you know, a big change. I would argue that's because the internet was a revolution of information. Fundamentally, you know, music, let's say, is information. Um, information was set free during, you know, the, the past 25 years. Um, but now we have something different. To your point, on-chain is a revolution of value. Um, and that adds a super interesting and powerful layer here. So it, maybe expand a bit on, you know, how you think, um, you know, this might actually deliver on some of the promises that we had hoped for, you know, 20 to 25 years ago with the internet. You know, to, to say something really trite, but like the, you know, the, the medium, the medium shapes everything, right? And so I think the medium of Twitter and the medium of Instagram, you know, filtered and taught us what it means to stand out, what it means to command attention, like even set, created this sort of core belief that a uh, the core unit of a website is like an individual user. Um, and these are things that I think change uh, in an on-chain world. Um, you know, if you think about in that Web2 world, if we're a group of creators and we want to, we do want to collaborate, we do want to have a split of something economically, like how do you do that? Are you creating an LLC? Like you just trusting one person to hold all the money? Like there's a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of trades there that are not great, but in a world of a multi-sig, in a world of, a meta label, which is like you could just spin up and spin down. Suddenly, you have these native structures that create a, a very different kind of output. You know what? I I have been in this space, um, and I've kind of always been crypto skeptical, and, and feel like you know the world of just cryptocurrencies is uh, pretty gross, is not providing a ton of value. Um, obviously, it's like played on all sorts of ponzonomics and bad parts of human behavior. Um, however, like my feeling has always been that cryptocurrencies are simply the first product application of a blockchain, but like not the end of them. And to me, if I think of the, of a, of a blockchain as being a centralized source of information, I know, I know why we talk about everything being decentralized in crypto and web three, but to me, it's powers that it's centralized. I can say, that's the real one, or there are a hundred of these. And I know because there's a contract that proves that that's the case. And we can all point to the same node, that yes, it's sharded and distributed everywhere, but like there is a single source of truth. Uh, and if I look at NFTs, NFTs show how much value there is in being able to identify like a, a source of truth. And there's even value in it for a picture, a picture that like very few people think is aesthetically pleasing. There's still value in being able to stay, it exists there. And to me that, as I look at the, the success of NFTs and especially now in crypto winter, I still see the success of NFTs happening. Uh, to me, it says that it's about the value of information being on chain, the value of information being centralized and thus being something that anyone can build on and work with. That that is just a huge unlock of, yeah, value to use your word of uh, like utility to use a word you're not supposed to use, uh, uh, but like all of these things happen because because an object exists on chain. So if I think about us, the idea of like I want to make a record, I, I I wrote a piece a few years ago called the Dark Forest Theory of the Internet that's got a few million reads at this point, and if you Google it, other people creating like copy paste versions of my own essay will appear higher than me in Google and they're attributed to other people, right? Uh, it's like got that big that other people have stolen it from me SEO wise. Right. And so like, I want to make their record that says, yo, I made the dark forest. Like this was it. This is the core thing. Here's why I wrote it. Here is like, I want it to be known that this was me. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, that being registered on chain, that being something that could be an artifact, that being something that people who love that work can collect and show love to me. Uh, and maybe I can show love to others through that. Like all of that is just such an unlock. And, it, and it's already such an unlock again, with just like the dumbest possible shit, just like some JPEGs, 
But like that value, that same equation of the value of a piece of information becoming a, a, a centralized truth, I think it's just going to keep happening. And so my feeling is that with the ETH merge, we switch from the crypto era to the on-chain era to where now like putting something on chain is cheap enough. It's fast enough. It's like energy unintensive enough that we can all do it. And that all that's just going to keep getting better. And you know, I think the cryptocurrency era is what we have to thank for all this infrastructure that exists now. But I, I, I personally just see a, a whole world that I think is going to take off. And, and it, it doesn't need cryptocurrencies to do it. It can do it with fiat. It can do it in all kinds of ways. But it's ultimately going to make for a better consumer experience. And, that, and that's why this is going to get adopted, is my, is my conviction. And how do you think that changes things for creators? I mean, just a, just one pause on on something there. You're talking about the difference between, um, you know, sort of the uh, the currency and the technology. I'd actually argue that um, that, that, that these things are, are are kind of one and the same because really, it's not that it's centralized; it's that the ownership is decentralized, right? Um, and so, you know, the the and the challenge I think that you know folks on the cryptocurrency side would would argue with is. Again, you know, if, if you have um, a, a, a a currency which is centralized, where ownership is centralized, then then it then you have now you have you know a bunch of financial problems. And I think similarly, if you have, um, you know, in, in other words, you know, another way to look at it simply is, I, I, you know, will my children have access to my iCloud account thirty years from now? Who the fuck knows? Because because it it is actually owned by a single person and will probably go the way of MySpace and Flickr. Um, you know, yet if it's on these public blockchains, they, they become, you know, they become immortal, right? Um, yeah. that, that's, that's the thing. So how might this world, um, be different for creators? Let's, let's talk about the, the magazine that you guys just, um, published, which is called after the creator economy. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, yes, I'm using no, right. no notes, no notes at all. Um, the, um, and you know, really, well, that, that title is, is, um, it sounds a bit ominous, but it's it's specific when you read the when you read the magazine itself. So maybe just describe for the audience what it what what you meant by that. Yeah, well, it's like a it's like a hundred page zine with a lot of great voices: uh, Matt Dryhurst, Kia Krutler, um, Picture Plane, talking about their experiences being a creator over the past ten years, and and basically it points to uh, some significant challenges with the creator economy norms. Power, all power, tends to reside in platforms and not individuals. Um, memory. There's a constant problem of content being lost. Like most of the stuff on the web that we see as our core culture is like so flimsy. It's ability, like it's storage, you know, when I you wish talk about I had the photos I took on the BC Boys tour in 1995, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if anyone does, you know, by the con- way, please send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> context, you know, work, creator economy work lacks context. You're just in this feed. Like I kind of think the creator economy is like radio. You know, we're all just competing to get this slot, but really radio is run by advertisers and the stations who just want people to keep listening. Those are the content platforms. We're all just like trying to get our song in the air. So I mean, I think this like centralized, decentralized thing is it's a, it's a, it's, it's like a language and, you know, decentralization is such a shibboleth, it's such a mantra in web three, but I think it, you know, to me, like Drake Take Care Decentralized is like there's a billion representations of it online and like you can listen to it in a different place. It's like how someone like links to it on a blog, like images, million images that show up in Google image search, like it's everywhere and it's nowhere. But maybe an on-chain version of Take Care would be there is a canonical version of it that maybe everyone is like has a, an edition of or that uh, – you know, is represented as this is the the core truth of like the liner notes and who is on this work and what it's about. And this is how we make sure that it's preserved forever. Um, you know, and then it's like, you could have a million players and a million different copies and representations of that all around the web. They would just all point back and say, oh yeah, this is, this is a version of, you know, take care by, by Drake. Um, and so to me, that's like, it's a subtle difference, but like for me as a writer, um, you know, I, I'm very aware that like all of my writing is sitting on like a Squarespace server or like Medium servers or Substack servers. And there's like, I have no guarantee that that stays here after I die or even before I die. You know, my, my personal website, which is like my portfolio of everything I do, like that only exists as long as I pay Squarespace $140 a year. 
And that is ridiculous. Like I want that to be on chain. I want like what I have made as my autobiography. I want the context of it, what it has meant to me. Um, and like it's representations to be preserved in a way that I, I can feel some confidence in. And like I as a I as an artist am happy to invest time and money into doing that. And to me, that notion of like, how am I preserving my own story? How am I sharing my own context and meaning? Like, that's like really deep stuff. And the second you start looking at all the different options we have for like personal websites and personal catalogs, they're like, totally. no one is thinking of that way. There's no structured data. It's just like HTML and CSS and no one's giving two shits about what you put into it. And so I think that it's just a, uh, I guess it's like, you know, it's part of it's like seeing the internet as being the real world. You know, it's like, that's the forum that ultimately matters most to me for where my work is seen. It's true. It's like, it matters more there than IRL. And, and it's just sort of looking at because of web three, because of the on-chain era, being able to look at the tools we've been using and suddenly see these massive deficiencies of like, you don't know how long things are going to be preserved. You're reliant on so many tools and structures that you have zero control over your goals are very different than the goals of every single service you use and we've had no choice but i think in this i think in this new era there will be that choice and um and i think for creative people 95% of them hate crypto want nothing to do with crypto crypto feels like everything that they make art to stay away from but yet this this notion of being able to record the real version of the work the notion of being able to create a collectible edition of something without more material creations, you know, digital value, all those things are like very aligned with any creative person's interests and with their goals. And so I think to me, that's like, that's what got me over the hump of like, I, I don't even just want to be on the sidelines. Like I want to make things. Cause like, I, I can feel this gap in my own practice. And so, yeah, I, I think, I think that's where it comes. You know, I don't think it's immediate. I think, that, I think it takes a year or two, but I, I think a lot of people are going to get to a similar mind space. Well, and I think you guys are going to be super important in this. Um, you know, it's funny because when I was reading the zine, I, I had the feeling of, of what you're saying, that um, these are these two worlds that have to be bridged. Um, and because I, I know exactly what you mean, there are so many people who I, idealistically uh, would resonate uh, with what you're saying and with what's in, in that zine. But they just haven't got there because, you know, Elon Musk talking about Dogecoin on Saturday Night Live makes them want to throw up, right? Um, like every every noun in that sentence is is what they're against. Um, so, you know, that's a long road. I think it's probably longer than a couple of years. Uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll make a lot of progress. Um, and, you know, as you, as you said at the beginning, you know, small success is, is, um, is still success, right? Um, the couple ideas I want to... I wanna, um, talk about from within that, I think, you know, I, I, this notion that creators are exhausted from the world of, you know, TikTok, you know, Instagram, YouTube, I think is, is one big thing. And I think that like, as we think about, um, just like when we were thinking about, um, you know, that what was possible on the web with artists, we were putting it in juxtaposition to, you know, what was possible in before, you know, in the world of TV movies, uh, and, and record labels, et cetera, magazines, newspapers. Um, you know, when we're looking at this Web3 world, we're kind of putting in juxtaposition of, of, you know, what's possible on YouTube and Instagram. And, you know, let's be honest, like, you know, YouTube has made stars of a lot of people who wouldn't have been able to be stars in the old world. And, and you know, now maybe we'll, we'll get to, you know, a more pluralistic place um, th thanks, thanks to Web3. So I, I, guess, um, I guess that's, that's one. How, how do you feel about that? I like that, you, you know, in the, in the zine, you know, you, you, you discuss like the word creator and, and why it became the creator economy and why maybe the word economy is a tough one for, for people to stomach. Um, and then, you know, you titled the piece after the creator economy. So what is specifically after the creator economy? What comes next? Yeah, well, I, I think that there are, um, I, mean, I think YouTube is an amazing platform and like YouTube's revenue splits are great, you know, and I, I think there, I think there's a lot of, a lot of great stuff that YouTube does. Same with Substack. I think Substack is killer like and wonderfully aligned with the interests of creators and like i am all in a full believer um i think what we're looking at after the creator economy is you're you're seeing um well number one you're seeing all of us have like fully ingested this notion of like we all got to compete with each other to be the star and so there is this like 
uh, frenemy relationship that I think is very common that uh, I think is like just a part of this cultural experience we've gone through for the past 10 years. What we think comes after the creator economy is this very old idea that we've lost recently, but that you should collaborate with other people with whom you see the world the same way. You know, the five people who also write about the same thing you write about, those are not your competitors. Those are your collaborators. Like you should be doing bigger projects together. In a web two world, there was just no practical way to do that. Like the steps were so high. It's like forming an LLC, trusting each other with a bank account. Like, you know, there's just a lot of things that people are not going to do unless they're really, really, really motivated. But in a world of multi-sig wallets, a very fungible identity of, uh, you know, uh, just like a, a real play around how we, uh, you know, interact and congregate and come together online. I think the idea of forming smaller groups, forming meta labels, forming uh, a DAO to use a 2022 term, um, you know, those are things that are just like, can be quite practical and quite easy. And so I think that what we're going to see is just more and more of um, those single star uh, performers, creators banding together and banding together, not for all of their practice. I think everyone will still have their individual practice, but they will just be these larger works that they're doing, you know, because they care about social justice. They care about the environment because they want to stand for certain styles of art that might not be in favor anymore. And I think that you'll just see that that becomes a new sense of like positive social value where your value is less how many followers you have and the value is more who are you in a squad with? You know, who, who squads with you? That's really the show of like, are you quality or not? Because we've seen that like you can amass a lot of followers by just being extremist or being ridiculous or also by being excellent. But I think that like how others vouch for you will be an increasingly important social value online. Um, and that, you know, like what I think of as like content in the web two world, content is anything you have to make other than the art just to like promote your work. And I think that we, what we want to see is a decrease in content and an increase in like actual creative output, you know? And, and so I think in a world where we don't always, don't always have to be the star in the show, this week could be my drop next week. It's your drop. And I'm just like going to be a good editor for you. And I'm going to be a good hype man. Once your thing goes out, it's my turn again in four weeks. But together, we're suddenly putting out eight things a month, repping like skating, you know, like that is a great trade. That is a trade that you're having a larger cultural impact. I think economically, you're probably doing better. And you're, you're just like less bullshit, less bullshit and more collaborating with people who see the world the way you see it. And if we just look back hundreds, thousands of years in human history, like that's always been the way. It's always been the way. And so, you know, we just need some primitives that make that normal, that make that accessible and not the thing that you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. And so to me, that's what the meta label form really represents is it's a structure that allows for creative people to collaborate. And that hasn't been there for a while. And like the label form, and especially the indie label, I think is the closest to like that pure vision of just people who care so deeply about a world that they're going to devote their lives to like helping other people put out things that speak to that, you know, and like, we both grew up seeing that as like the coolest shit ever. You know, you devote your life to DC hardcore. You devote your life to underground hip hop. You, you know, you care about Chicago house music so deeply. You're like going to put out records, making almost no money on it. Like that is, that's like the clergy, you know, that, that is I like agree. true goodness, you and know? Adding, and that's what I, I really wanted to get to. And thank you because as you're talking, like so many things are, are, are coming to mind here. And I, I, I wanted to just try to tie it together because what I really like is, as you said, you're creating a format and that, that, and that, and I think that's why I wanted to make the Kickstarter format point as well, because I think that proves that there's a power in that, right? People see the power of Kickstarter. And then when you realize or, and you remember the Kickstarter was actually quite simple and there were many things you, you didn't do intentionally. And that took a lot of, um, a lot of restraint, but gave a lot of power. It's like Lambda calculus. There's this power through this, through, through this, through the simplicity. Also, I think that you're pointing to, I think your, your, and your points about, you know, DC hardcore. I mean, I'll actually, I'll go the, you know, you're, you're really talking about, um, discord raucous, um, you know, etc. et cetera. And wax and like, tracks, yeah. wax tracks. And those things, those things also kind of had, they were fatal flaws or look at, you know, the fact that alternative tentacles and discord still exist today, um, is due to two people, 
right? Not due to, to organizations or squads necessarily, but due yeah. to two individuals yeah. who never gave up, right? Um, yeah. And so the ability to make that, to make that um, actually more of a true organization, I find I- incredibly interesting. And I was going to make two examples, you know, one as ancient as Grand Royal and one as, as recent as, as 90s kids, which Fuck Render just started, because they're both big examples to me. When I, in my head, of course, it's impossible not to um, to think of Grand Royal when, when you're talking because I lived through it and you're, the squad that was with Grand Royal was incredibly powerful. Not only was it, you know, the BC Boys, people like Jay Babcock who went on to create create Arthur and Doug Aitken who became a, a great artist and Jeff McFetridge who became a great fine artist and as well and um, Spike Jones who is Spike Jones and like these were all part of the squad. Mark Lumen, you know, and when you think of the power that's in that, but really the power was never really harnessed, right? I mean, everybody, it's like having, you know, having all the ingredients doesn't mean you're going to make a great soup, right? Um, and if power goes further, we had Gary Gersh, who, you know, used to run Capitol Records and John Silva, who's arguably the greatest, you know, manager in the history of, 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 of rock and roll, um, you know, but, but still, you know, all of these people are almost stronger apart than together. So I see mm. um, Meta Label as a potential to create a strength um, and to create a unit um, that, that, to your point, can create a structure where they can live. And what makes me excited is thinking about how people that are younger than me, frankly, are going to use that structure. And that's where I come back to Fuck Render and 90s Kids. Because, you know, talking to Fuck Render about 90s Kids makes me super excited. I'm like, could this be the thrasher of tomorrow, right? There won't be a thrasher right. tomorrow. The, the medium is the message, as you said and McLuhan said. And, um, you know, the, the format of, of the skate magazine of tomorrow, uh, you know, won't be color newsprint like Thrasher was when I was a kid. Um, it probably also won't be Instagram like it w- and, and YouTube like it was when Fuck Render was a kid, but it could mm-hmm. be a meta label, right? Mm-hmm. And if, if we made um, the 90s kids, um, you know, meta label, right, and, and what we released was basically, you know, today's version of Thrasher. And part of that group were the best skate photographers of today of all ages, right? As an example, the best skate writers today of all ages. And I say that because I want, you know, Craig Stesic and I want the Craig Stesic of tomorrow, right? To be a part of this collective. Um, That's incredibly exciting. And to your point about crypto versus culture, um, I think we could make something that was not interesting to NFT flippers, but the most interesting, interesting thing in skateboarding this year. And I think yeah. that's what you're going for is something that is yeah. meaningful within the culture of whomever is creating the meta label and may have zero interest to the broader world of crypto and NFTs and blur.io. Right. Um, and I think that's 100%. the thing that people on neither side can see because on one side I'm like, yeah, but is it moonbirds? And then on the other <laughs> side, somebody's like, yeah, fuck crypto. And you and I are stuck yeah. in the middle going, uh, yeah. for me, I'm like, I want to make the next Grand Royal or Thrasher. And you're creating, um, you know, scaffolding on which to build that. Okay, now I want to see those exist. So I guess, you know, maybe to to, to wrap us up, because we should let our, our, our poor listeners go and, and you and I can can do this do this more later. Ah, I was going to say one more thing. I've got to give Hedvig credit. Um, my girlfriend leaned over to me at the Cure show and um, and said, why aren't there NFTs for music lyrics? And, and I like sat there another 20 minutes and I leaned back over to, I was like, that is an amazing idea. Right. Because I was, I'd already kind of done the math in my head of like, how much money does Drake make on the lyrics? Right. And then how much could he make if those lyrics were a drop? And now the lyrics are a available and b valuable. And I, I kind of like did, but your meta label creates a, a, a content, you know, creator for, well, for that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, 90s kids, like imagine 90s kids for the next 12 months had four drops a month with a different artist, different skater each time. And some of them are an NFT, some are a party, some could be a physical thing. But the point is all of it's like, you know, telling the story uh, of skateboarding in a way that feels true to whoever's involved. And that it, it's just an engine where you're constantly just putting out a drop. Every drop, the creator, photographer, whoever gets paid. The money goes back to the label to make sure costs are accounted for so it keeps going. Like if you do that for 12 months, that is a – you're going to have a huge footprint at the end of that. And you and that is like – and with it sitting on these on-chain rails, having transparent financials, like I think a lot of the shit that labels in the past got in trouble with of operations, accounting, I mean a lot, those things are 
not easy and not joyful, but they, those can be easier in this world. But to me, it's like, I don't, I don't see how that project loses. You know, I don't, I don't see I, how I they totally lose agree. in that. And I don't see how well, they don't also, walk away with a bigger audience at the end. And it's also orders of magnitude more interesting than what's the floor price. Right. Yes. Yes. You know, I mean, if you think about it, it, what we're, I feel like the conversation we're having, I hope that people walk about, walk away from this thinking, you know, how much opportunity there is here and, um, uh, and really how primitive the, the NFT and on-chain world um, that, that we live in today is compared to what's coming uh, when this is fully realized and these two worlds are combined. Another example from my past I'll use is I'll remember, I remember when I was making music on next computers in 1990 and 91 and I, I was like, why doesn't everyone make music on computers? Like, you know, I, and I thought it was me. I'm like, there must be a reason, but I'm just a dumb kid. So I don't know what the reason is. Well, the reason was it just took time for those two worlds to combine because there was a world of nerds who had access to computer tools. And then there was a world of creators who did not yet have access to those tools. So, um, you know, you're building and, and I think you're putting culture out there and, and I think you're scratching the surface, but I think it's, you know, we, we, you know, it's going to take time for these ideas to permeate and to, and to sink in. And I hope sincerely that this, you know, this, this conversation helps, you know, at least some weirdos like us, um, you know, kind of get the joke. And, uh, and if, if nothing else, fuck render, come on, man, let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Think- you know, it's not about, it's not about rarity. It's about love. It's about love, like giving love to great work, be able to share in the love, participate in it. Like, I, I had a conversation with someone big in Web3 and at the end, they're like, I can't believe you didn't talk about rarity once with any of this. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's ra- rarity is not what someone who loves something's thinking about. I mean, you know, you don't want to be dumb about what you use to spend your money on, but like they're thinking about, it's cool. I love who made it. Like this yeah. is dope. Oh, well, that's why do, the thing. Why, do, that's I, the why do I buy, why do I buy an album from Bandcamp? It's not because of the rarity, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's to support yeah. the artist, to, to have the artifact, to have been there when, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, so many interesting things here. Um, I actually like that. Yancy, thank you so much. I'm really, really happy that we, that we did this. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a moment in, it's a moment in time. Um, be fun to, to listen to this 10 years from now. You know, what's amazing. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this. If you, have you ever read, um, Oscar Wilde, the, the critic as artist? You know, just, just, not. just, just grab it and read it. It's You'll, you will it's fall good. out of your chair laughing how relevant it is <laughs> to this conversation. It's going it to hurt written, me. It's going to hurt me. It was me. released in 1890. So um, it'll be really fun to listen to this conversation in, in uh, how many years from now is that? hundred and I'm downloading the PDF right now. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, man. All right, thank you so much. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Do your own research, and the loss or profit is your sole responsibility. Stay safe.